Were there they can share. They can share the screen. So that's okay. If we make them co-host, they'll have the disturbance of participants coming in. So let us not disturb them. Are you going to uh, allow everybody to join us then? The yeah, way? sure. We're just waiting. Like when you say Gary is there, yeah, you're ready to make them co-host. They'll have the disturbance of participants. Yeah, yeah. We can. We can start. Please uh, admit everybody. And okay. um, I'll go ahead to, to introduce. Okay, just for your information, we're li live on YouTube. To, uh, All right, we're live on YouTube now. All right, sounds like we're ready. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, so can I start by, sorry, I probably should stand in the middle. Um, my name is Xiao Chen. I am, you probably can't see me right now because the camera setting is a little strange here, but um, I am the teaching associate for this team project, uh, uh, Solutions for the Construction of a Lunar Base. And uh, we have some of the participants uh, in the room right now. Can you please raise your hands to say hi to them? Hello, <laughs> okay. Yeah, so we uh, had a really good discussion today on how to start our team project. And uh, we really want to thank you for your sponsorship and giving this public lecture. Um, and uh, for the, the ones listening, um, from uh, in the room and uh, from afar. Uh, let me just quickly um, introduce the uh, speakers, which is really, really quick. Um, so what I have here says, uh, Robert Chambers leads business development and strategy for, our, uh, for Lockheed Martin's human space flight activity. And, um, uh, and then, oh, sorry, we're on the wrong thing. Uh, and Daniel Ricci is an advanced programs leader at Lockheed Martin as well. So they will be talking about um, uh, leading the crew, robots and as uh, human partners and uh, about uh, lunar exploration as well. So uh, without further ado, let's hand to our uh, speakers and um, the floor is yours now. Thank you. Well, uh, so I'll, I'm going to um, let Danielle kind of uh, talk us through um, as we walk through this. So she'll she'll be sort of our uh, our usher through all of this. Uh, we love I love being interrupted a little bit, and so as you guys come up with questions, um, we'd be happy to field them during the presentation. We'll also ensure that we reserve say 15 minutes, 20 minutes towards the end um, to really prompt you guys to ask some questions. Um, but it gets really boring when it's just us talking. Um, the uh, it's super exciting project that you guys are doing, um, the moon is near and dear to our hearts as, as you can sort of see from the picture here. Um, we're very interested in how we get to Mars in the long run, but the, the path to, lar to Mars is always left past the moon, um, as Danielle likes to say. So the surface systems and the infrastructure require, I'm, I'm actually the one that always says that. The, um, uh, but the infrastructure, and the surface uh, and the infrastructure required for that um, is, is uh, really, really important. And so um, with you guys taking a look at what does it take to build up a moon base, part of what we'd love to talk about is, you know, what does that even really mean? What, what is a moon base? And what are the, the aspects um, or filters that you might want to look at that as you start to lay out your project? Um, and so Danielle's got some, uh, some charts that will allow us to have that dialogue with you guys. So thanks for letting us be here and I'll hand it to Danielle here and I'll just interrupt all the time. Yeah, again, this is gonna be really casual, very conversational. We appreciate the questions as they come up. So we have a presentation today, but we'll be going back and forth in terms of the slides and then the content. And the things that we really wanna talk about is when you talk about a moon base, you know, there's three, what Rob was calling lenses in which you can look at the lunar base. And a lot of these implications will help determine where you select or help bound the problem or create more problems for you to try and solve. Um, the first of these is location. When you think about this, is it a polar location or is it equatorial? Another question, which we kind of talk about a little bit later is, are you looking at a mobile or a fixed base? Again, location you know, will drive a lot of your engineering um, just from those two questions alone. And then when we think about what is the mission or the purpose of your base? Are you looking at pure science? Do you want the locations on the moon that you know, scientists across the world have decided are the most valuable in answering questions of where did the earth come from? How has it changed over the years? Um, or are you looking at 
using um, certain locations on the earth or excuse me, on the moon to process regolith or to look for volatiles, um, or are you trying to co-locate with other assets? So these things really help drive, you know, what type of mission it is along with what equipment and then how your base can support this mission. And then also what other infrastructure is around you? Does your moon base need to be completely self-supporting or are there other things like power, comm assets, um, things in that you need to support in a permanently shadowed region, region that um, you really have to consider in your design. And the last is the relationship to other assets. And this kind of, they all touch one another. They kind of overlap a little bit. And this would be anything from other agency, other space agencies, other commercial entities, whether it's a lander, a rover, um, a comm antenna orbiting the moon, another lander, um, your departure mission lander. Um, again, it, it can be anything. So, you know, really thinking about what are the other assets that you require or are you trying to be near those things? And then the last bullet on there, it's not a number four, but it's tied closely in how do all of these tie to what are the considerations for going to Mars? So again, we when we look at what Rob said, going, past the moon to Mars, you really don't want to have one-stop shop solutions that end at the moon and don't continue to Mars. You always want to think about how do those things tie together, understanding that there are significant differences in the atmosphere regolith between the two um, planetary bodies, but really thinking about what are the processes, what are the lessons learned that we need to make sure we keep in mind as we move out to Mars. So Rob, anything to add? Uh, no. Okay, great. So we'll go ahead and start with this first slide. I've got two what we'll call nerd science slides. And this is really thinking about, you know, using those robotic missions like we talked about with the title page of this presentation and what did we learn from them and how do we want to use that information moving forward to either do more science, figure out where we want to land, figure out what else we want to do there. So the first one's Lunar Prospector and it's looking at all of the volatiles and you can see the map on the upper right um, that are showing with this instrument that may be of use. You know, it's really interesting from a scientific perspective because we find those volatiles on Earth. Um, but in terms of, you know, if you want to actually build a moon base there, do you need any of those volatiles for your moon base? Are you trying to 3D print solar arrays? And one of those is going to be really important for that 3D printing process specifically for solar arrays. Um, and then with GRAIL, GRAIL was mapping the gravitational fields and the interior structures. So if you're looking at building a lunar base that's, you know, interested in perhaps using lava tubes, you know, GRAIL will help you find that. But at the same time, it's telling us all about how the moon formed, how the Earth-Moon system interacts together. And so, again, getting back to the what's the purpose um, as we kind of walk through those different lenses, you know, when you go down to your lunar base, what science are you trying to actually perform or what are you trying to do with your mission that's making use of previous science? Yeah, you know, and from, um, from location, 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 as they always say, at least here in the US, um, from a real estate perspective, the, uh, so the, the poles um, have a lot of volatiles. If you think about it, you know, they're, they're more shadowed more of the time, so that makes sense. So there's more water at the poles than there is at the equator. Um, the lava tubes are more prevalent, um, I think, in equatorial regions rather than the, um, the polar regions. So um, there may be interesting things to do at the poles that you can't do uh, at, the, um, at the equator, but you'll have more of an infrastructure you have to put in place at the poles. Um, the poles, just in terms of talking some of the differences that you guys would want to think about from a location perspective, um, the, uh, the poles have nights that can be as short, well, they can have nights that never come, right? Um, in all daylight, if you're at the, the so-called peaks of eternal light, um, all the way up to permanently shadowed regions that never get sunlight on them. Um, most of the days around the poles, realistically, with the shadows and all that, you're probably talking 10 day um, nights, whereas at the you know, equator, it's, it's a full two weeks. Um, and so that's a, a, a power and thermal management problem and so you have to decide which of those do you want to deal with. Um, the other thing is, is remember again, from a science perspective and a volatiles perspective, um, the far side has been bombarded 
much more than the near side of Earth, getting obviously it's tidally locked and we block um, a, a fair amount of the moon from bombardment from uh, meteoroids and, and asteroids and um, other heavy metals, let's say, and water. So the far side is fascinating um, in its own right because there's more available um, at the surface than what you see here on the, on the near side. But that obviously brings in the question of how do you provide a logistics train to the far side? So we tend to think of things as polar versus equatorial and near side versus far side in terms both of the challenges and the potential value that, the, uh, that we've been learning from the robots. And it's not until we get ground truth with the humans that we'll really know for sure how easy it is to access all that. Yeah, good point. So kind of tying into the additional science slide, what Rob was talking about, you can see the topographic landing sites here on the left-hand side. Um, so again, really good places to land, places that are really not helpful to land. Um, you can see those permanently shadowed regions and then overlaid in the center of this chart, um, the blue dots represent what we think are water ice. Um, we've yet to confirm how much is there, but we can confirm it's there using data from LRO. So again, what Rob was talking about with that location, do you wanna be on the very rim of that crater so that you can get light the entire time, but then go down and get water ice from one of those permanently shadowed regions? If that's so, then you'll wanna think about how do you actually build infrastructure that can get to those regions, where would you land? Because there's a lot of areas up on that left-hand side, you won't be able to land. And then where do you wanna put your power stations, specifically your solar arrays? Um, how do you wanna put them on top of a peak? And then how do you get like a power line down to a habitat per se? So all of these things are to consider when you decide where you're gonna go and you know back time to what are you gonna do when you're there? Anything else to add for this one? We can jump back to it. Okay, great. So thinking more about that, I did pick out, this is another view on lunar surface lo locations and it's, um, the, the map's been rolled out um, for you. So again, you can see those Southern regions, but all of these are areas of interest that scientists may want to send robots and humans for different reasons. So you can see there's a vast, um, <laughs> entire uh, surface where we would want to send people if the scientists had their way. And so getting back to, you know, what do you want to do and what do you want to find there? You can see that there's a lot of really interesting things at each of these sites. You can see the pit, pits and craters and lava tubes in the middle, again, at the equatorial region. You can see Schrodinger Basin, South Pole Aiken, solar polar regions, which we just looked at. And then you get these magnetic anomalies over in the Western region. So again, what are we trying to look at influences? How do you get there? And then like Rob pointed out, what are your thermal constraints? Again, those equatorial regions are going to see lunar night for up to two weeks, whereas on the poles, you know, you're probably looking at like three to four days, maybe less, depending on where you are. So, and that has really big implications for your power and your thermal constraints. The uh, one of the the things here, so there, I was kind of up. There's what ten on this page, um, and, and those are probably. Um, 10 sites from eight people, right? Because uh, each person has multiple uh, opinions as well. And by golly, every one of those is the place you need to go. Um, one of the things that from a, a Lockheed perspective is we've worked with our, our various scientists, planetary scientists um, for decades, um, is the ability to do sorties because um, we don't know what questions to ask or answer. And so um, for what it's worth, we're um, more fans of lightweight, if you will, um, have it, uh, base camps that can be moved around, um, you know, think, um, I don't know, uh, nomads, as opposed to setting up a, a no kidding city. So the ability to put kind of a forward observation post, if you will, and then um, be able to either move that to a new location um, or drop in another one because these are modular and, and again, sort of lightweight from an expense perspective. Um, is really important uh, from our perspective because of the fact that that um, you're going to want to go to different places for different reasons. That in turn can drive your your power infrastructure. So if you're going to do a, a big nuclear power plant, um, uh, which you know I'm a big fan of nuclear because you know it doesn't turn off at night, unlike solar arrays. Um, then do I put you know do I put ten 
nuclear power plants out here, or do I put one nuclear power plant and have relays? Um, can we do wireless relays, or do we need to, to um, haul wire around? Um, should we do stuff from orbit rather than on the surface? And so as you look at these lenses of location, you quickly get into the lens of, okay, should it be permanent or mobile? And then um, how much infrastructure do we want to rely on that's out there, for example, like orbital power beam? Um, so those pieces, you'll have to, to make some decisions early on and do a, a bit of a point solution. But the more you realize what you're potentially giving up, um, the better, because then you can say, all right, but here's how I'm going to address the ability to get to these other sites um, as part of an overall infrastructure. I think what, what I wouldn't recommend going down is saying we're going to have 10 um, bazillion dollar, uh, very high dollar asset, very expensive to implement and maintain sites independent, right? You somehow want to think about how you can have an infrastructure in the room, um, even if initially you focus on one location to start with. Yeah, that's a good point. And when we think about infrastructure at the moon, especially with people, the very first thing is landing. Uh, so again, you know, how do you land? How much mass are you carrying down? Are you going to bring, you know, specifically rovers, landers, a lot of infrastructure with you that'll drive the size and capability of where your lander can actually land? Are you trying to reach, you know, close by to other destinations? One thing to think about when you start to build up a base is you're going to need a lot of landers, regardless of whether it has humans or just infrastructure, big and small. So again, those 10 metric tons or those small 500 kilogram landers, all of them have value in building a moon base. One thing to consider though, is generally they need to be kept about two kilometers apart because of that lunar dust. So it kicks up dust and then has the um, potential to impact and potentially harm your other assets on the surface. So as you're thinking about that lunar base, you know, a lot of people have talked about doing advanced 3D printing of a landing pad, which would, you know, greatly help that issue. Again, you'd have to figure out how to get stuff off the landing pad and clear it off, um, get the power to actually use um, the machines, which is going to take a lot of power to do that in situ resource utilization to actually create that landing pad. Um, so those are all considerations when you're thinking about how to build a base. It's not just, you know, let's get there. It's going to be how do we get there repeatedly, accurately, and then without causing impact to our other assets. Literally. Literally. <laughs> The, um, one of the other things we spend a lot of time thinking about, and, and depending on how um, the, the uh, project is, uh, is formulated, um, it's one thing to talk about what the end state looks like. It's another to talk about what's the order in which you should build it up. So um, because there's, there's probably a, a figure of merit associated with how much you have to haul there versus what you can build there. Well, in order to build it there, you just need power, right? Power drives everything and you're gonna need mobility. So what is the, the sort of optimized system where you, you know, put down mobility, put down power, use the mobility to install the power, use the power then to generate, um, I don't know, ISRU based, um, whether it's fuel or regolith in order to build the structures. And so what do you really have to bring from the earth and what can you build locally? And there's a logical order, there's lots of different choices, but there's logical orders in which you um, install those systems. Um, and so it, it's, it's relatively easy, one could say, to come up with the concept for a bunch of domes or um, perhaps, um, you know, pressure, uh, soft goods pressures, you know, inside a, a lava tube. It's another to say, well, how are you going to get there? Because in order to be in the lava tube, you probably need a fair amount of excavation equipment um, just to provide your path down in there and have mobility, but then you're going to need power. So what's the order in which you want to do that? Yeah, and so Rob kind of touched on this, and I just want to emphasize that when we talk about ISRU or in-situ resource utilization, there's really three kinds. It's the kind where you want to use and get into water ice specifically for water oxygen or sorry hydrogen oxygen propellant drinking breathing all of those uses the other two are is one you just need soil or dirt regolith in order to build you know that dome or that surface 3d print yourself a habitat 
that. And then that last one is more specific to the volatiles. Like I mentioned earlier, if you want to print solar arrays, you need to be really close to those specific materials that go into your solar arrays. So again, when you talk about like, where do you want to go and how do you build it up with that order of operations, keep in mind that there are those three different flavors that very much impact where you want to be and how you get there. And then we did touch on this at the very beginning with the orbital assets. This is um, a version of what NASA is calling the gateway. It's an earlier concept, and this is meant to be an orbital waypoint for humans to meet. Um, they would uh, dock with the gateway for coming up on Orion. A lander would dock and then take them down to the surface, kind of like we saw in the previous image. And so one of the things that you also want to think about is given your region, what do these orbital assets offer you in terms of the ability to land? So this particular gateway is supposed to be in a near rectilinear halo orbit, which looks like a potato chip. And so there's a very specific time duration it takes to get down to that lunar region. And I think it's like a six and a half day time transit time down to that surface, specifically in that region. And then there are other areas that aren't accessible all that frequently based on this orbit. Or if you do a distant retrograde orbit, you're gonna have more access equatorially, but difficulty getting to the poles in terms of the amount of propellant required. And then there's always the question of, you know, can this asset help you with a calm relay to earth? Um, given that at some locations, whether it's a far side or, you know, permanently shadowed regions, you may not have a direct line of sight back to Earth. So thinking about not just your surface assets, but your orbital assets and what those provide you in terms of intermediate transit down to the surface for humans, comm relay, and then also can it just be a dock while you're waiting for other assets to aggregate in space before they get down to the surface? Yeah, I think the... Um, uh... So the whole logistics train of, uh, so if you think back to Apollo, right, it was fantastic um, in, in terms of you know, transformational for the whole world, right? Um, but the reason that it went, many reasons why it didn't continue, um, but part of the reason for that was uh, that there was no logistics train, right? Everyone was completely on their own. Um, and so NASA talks a lot about a sustainable architecture here. And um, everyone has their own definition and opinion on what sustainable means. But one of the things it means for me is the ability to provide food and water and transportation to and from um, any of these, these, um, these surface sites in a way that's economical. And so um, I would encourage you guys, as you think about both the location and the balance of of local capability versus reliance on orbital assets, um, you think about what that logistics train will look like, including getting, like we said, food and water, a power communications, uh, particularly for far side activities. Um, the the other thing is, and this gets into, um, you know, you need a you need um what in the states we call the shtick, right? What is it that you're doing at that location other than not dying? Um, so that's like job number one, don't die. Job number two is, are you pr just performing science? Um, are you um, perhaps excavating and doing prospecting for someone to come and you know, harvest materials and so forth? Um, or are you producing something that, that um, earthlings will actually buy? And so propellant generation um, has long been talked about. Uh, the um, George Sowers and the folks Formerly, he was with ULA, so ULA and also the folks from Colorado School of Mines have talked a lot about harvesting water to be brought back to LEO to be used for um, in-space transportation and propulsion um, for LEO and making, uh, kind of getting into the COMSAT world because you're essentially using product water um, that you crack into fuel from the moon to, to uh, allow you to reposition communication satellites reducing the cost of the communication satellites and making money, frankly, um, on that from a, a, a bazillion dollar a year um, com market. Um, or, you know, there's always helium-3, um, other volatiles, um, or producing large structures. So the, the production of whether you're producing data or you're producing water or you're producing structures at, the, um, at, at your location how are you going to get that back off the surface? If it's if you're just producing data, 
um, then you can obviously beam that up, right, of course. But if you're actually going to produce um, raw materials or volatiles, how are you going to um, export that, if you will, um, up into orbit? So as you think about your your base, you know, think about what's what is the reason for its existence, and therefore, um, whatever you're going to produce. And again, it could just be ones and zeros, right? It could just be data um, and information. But if you're going to produce something other than data information, now you got to think about how you're going to get that off economically. And what assets from the rest of the enterprise, including gateway or transportation systems that are going back and forth from low Earth orbit to NRHO, how are you going to take advantage of all of those um, to close the business case um, on the, the lunar base? Yeah, and as we start to talk about lunar bases, I've got a sequence of images here that you know help are meant to help stimulate your thought process on what that looks like. So, you know, this is a pretty early on stage, but I think it's still really important to look at a couple of the assets. We've already talked about human landers. This lander in the background is, you know, a lightweight version of the commercial lunar payload services. So again, like a 500 kilogram lander, but the assets here, how did you get a habitat to the surface? How do you offload it? Again, all automated. You really don't want to have humans or astronauts being tasked with doing that work. Their time is far too expensive. And then how do you set up perhaps with some of these robotic excursions, your communication system or off to the lower right, what could be power production, either with uh, fission surface power, space nuclear, there's a lot of options there, again, or solar arrays. And then how do these things help you sustain your mission through the different environments, whether it be during the daylight or lunar night. And then again, how do they all aggregate together, given that there does have to be a separation between them when all these assets are landing? And then given you know how we wanna move humans around on the surface, think about, are you looking at a pressurized rover? Are you looking at an unpressurized rover like we saw in Apollo, a mobile habitat, a mobile base? Um, just mobilize the whole thing. So what are the pros and cons of each of those and how do they bring everything together, especially in the context of your environment and your mission along with that sequence of operations? Now might be a good time in this context because we have multiple things here, right? Is to talk about interoperability and standards. So um, I was just reading a, um, uh, one of our folks in our advanced programs has a, uh, an IEEE um, abstract paper that's going to go in later this year, um, talking about standards and how do you drive out standards in a way that um, that keeps it organic, but um, winds up where we where half of us aren't on. Uh, you guys are probably all too young for this, but Betamax versus VHS back in the days of videotapes. Um, uh, there's probably a more modern um, example of that as well. Uh, the um, I can't think of it. Versus anything else. Yeah, CDs versus eight tracks, whatever. Um, the the uh, the point being, you, what you want is everyone to adopt a standard, and yet you don't want to dictate the standard because, by definition, that's probably not a good. Thing. Um, and you want it to grow organically. Um, we at, at Lockheed, uh, we boy, exploration is bigger than one company, and certainly bigger than one country. Uh, so you're going to have to combine the skill and the will is what we talk about the whole world. I use that phrase a lot. I, I blame Danielle for it, but I use that phrase a lot. The skill and the will of everybody. Um, and so it's not going to be the case for one company. God, I, I would hate the, uh, a situation where one company is building all this stuff because we need to leverage everybody's uh, capabilities. So what you're going to have is English and metric units, and you're going to have um, 70 volt DC power and 28 volt DC power, and then you know the 120 volt AC that folks want. Um, you're going to have to work through what your interoperability and standards um, approach is, because what you don't want and what you can't afford is uh, for those that watched Apollo 13. You know the lower left uses round Eclipse filters and the upper right uses square filters. And so you need a lot of duct tape to connect those. Um, interoperability and the ability when things go poorly that um, everybody can pool resources and share is an inherent part of, I think, the sustainability of the systems. And so when you start looking at these pieces, 
Don't look at them as individual capabilities. Also think about how they're going to interrelate to one another and how you create that interrelatability, to make up a word, um, how you create that without stifling the creativity and the market of, of folks that are gonna build stuff independently. Yeah, and this, this picture is also meant to touch on that interoperability. So you can see just the path of humans and then the path of propellant oxygen and water alone, just to touch on those two things. And you can see how all these elements on the surface and in orbit can, may, will, interact with one another. And then there's other layers on top of this when you start talking about comm, data, um, and other services that they may provide. And so thinking about what Rob was getting back to with standards, and I would say USB is a better example of changing standards and how you know one thing generated very early on in exploration may have a different standard later on. Because again, all of this isn't gonna be available in the first year that you land, and it may be over a decade or more, at which point in time, all of these things will still need to communicate and work together. A better example than, than <laughs> the other one, micro USB and lightning for Apple. Like that is, that's yeah. just a crime against humanity. So um, let's not have that at the moon. The, um, um, the other thing that I love about this particular picture, these, these arrows are kind of like trade routes, if you will, um, in the old days, right? Old, 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 even older than me and Danielle. Um, back in the, in the days where uh, people were trading, um, you know, food for horses for whatever they did back then. Um, in this instance, it's what are you, what are the interrelationships going to be of your base with other elements? Um, and your interactions back with the earth. And so thinking about it kind of goes back to what we talked about or, or earlier, that what are your products that you're going to export, if you will, and what are your imports that you need in order to maintain your base, um, you know, and, and uh, be able to survive and thrive, if you will, um, on the surface. And then that last picture that I've got here, at least when we start talking about the three images for the lunar base is really showing a, a fairly advanced buildup of what could be a lunar base. It doesn't show exactly where on the surface, but you can really start to see the evolution between those three pictures of how you add more infrastructure over time um, and allowing, you can see there's like a solar array field, tank farms, modules, probably a food production facility, there's got to be a power production facility, and how these all had to be brought together. What's not in this picture are all the doers or the things, the robots that helped assemble and set all this up, because you didn't have an army of astronauts that are strong enough or dexterous enough in their suits to do that. You most likely had, which is much cheaper, robots to actually do all the pre-positioning, the deployments, the aggregation of these elements. And so as we look at the moon, we kind of talked about at the beginning of this presentation where everything from the moon does eventually get towards Mars. It won't be the exact same element. Again, you need to make sure that the reactiveness of the soil, um, the lunar regolith and the Martian soil is gonna be the same for that particular lander. If you use that, again, you have atmosphere to deal with at Mars, but the, the things that we talk about on the right-hand side, what science are you going after? How do you do that? How do you leverage robots, your propulsion systems? How do your humans, how are you keeping them safe, healthy, happy? Um, especially during much, much longer time periods as you extend from the moon to Mars. And then again, everything we talked about with infrastructure and operations most definitely applies to Mars. So I have a couple more slides here before we get to questions. Again, just thinking about how Mars is slightly different in terms of, we talked a lot about the moon. There's a couple of slides here just to think about Mars. So um, much, there's again, an atmosphere, totally different uh, soil. We're kind of trying to figure out what's there. We've never actually had a sample, so we don't quite know. We're using a lot of advanced technology on the instruments shown on the left in order to say, okay, is this water? Is this ice? Is it actually running sand? When you think about the recurring slope linear. Um, and then we start thinking about these questions of, again, the clay minerals here, could life have existed here? That's another question that when you start bringing an atmosphere into the question, can it have previously supported life? Um, and then also what are all of the considerations that we need to make when we go to a planet that could have supported life in terms of making sure we don't disrupt that ecosystem. 
And so um, I'll let Rob talk a little bit more about this, but it's it's meant to kind of show you how you would potentially get to Mars and land on the surface and perform those sortie missions to figure out where we would go and then set up a more permanent camp. Yeah, go back one slide. I was I was not. Oh. <laughs> you looked at me and I was pondering. It. Um, the uh, uh, so when we talk a bit about um, humans and and uh, a lot of you are probably very familiar with some of the analog studies. Uh, we have a uh, uh, one of our, our co-workers, Josh Ehrlich, spent nine months in high seas. High seas. And um, one of the things he said when they did their spacewalks, their EVAs on the surface, um, that it was absolutely um, game-changing that they could use drones. And, uh, of course, at Mars, I mean, the Ingenuity uh, helicopter proved indeed. You just It's one half Roe v. squared, right, for all the... Um, yeah, aerospace nerds out there. So you just need a really fast V because row is small. So you got to beat those those wings, big wings and lightweight and, and spin them fast, but that works. Um, there's analogous capabilities at the moon. Obviously, um, row is so small that, that V isn't practical, um, but certainly hoppers um, and uh, small orbital assets, um, small rovers that can go out. And so as you think about the infrastructure associated with the humans, we talk a lot about power and communications and how they're going to get their drinking water and all that. Um, but also, what are the, the little helpers, if you will, um, that you need to include as part of the infrastructure for your, your system? And how can those be as analogous as possible and feeble as possible to Mars? Um, we've got some pictures. Um, we, have, uh, we have way too many different slides um, that we could uh, show you guys. But one of them that always spoke to me was, um, craters at the moon and craters at Mars um, or, or uh, lava tubes that are very interesting. It, the most interesting parts of these planetary systems, or, uh, heavenly bodies, if you will, um, the most interesting ones are very difficult to get to and certainly not places where you want to land a lander. So thinking about this smaller infrastructure at the moon and how analogously that small infrastructure will be used at Mars um, ensures that you keep a feed forward um, concept. And, and that's not just, I don't know, it's, it, it's not just esoteric why you'd want to do that. It's very practical. Um, there's a lot of folks that want to make sure that what we do at the moon feeds forward to Mars. And so quite honestly, there's more money um, uh, associated and available to development if you have something that can be used in both places. So that's what got me thinking about this. Um, and. Uh, and the fact that with the atmosphere, we can have ingenuity uh, flying. Um, the last piece is really the, the last slide gets into the um, sort of the downstream vision. Um, one of the, it was funny, we, some of the earlier uh, or, or more recent uh, leadership folks at NASA, we were talking once and the concern had always been you get quote unquote stuck at the moon. And uh, our, our point has always been, and I think most people would agree, that you got to learn at the moon and move on to Mars. Um, you're always going to be expanding outward. Um, we don't show Venus, but Venus is pretty exciting. Uh, we're, we're building a couple of spacecraft that are going to go to Venus later this decade, um, and humans will, will ultimately follow. Um, so it's not a question of whether we stop at the moon. It's just a question of whether the systems that we build at the moon are dual use and that can be used for Mars. And so everything from um, long duration cryogenic storage um, to single system landers, um, that thing on the right is not a, it's not a Starship. Um, and we independently had come up with that before SpaceX announced Starship, but the truth is, um, you know, form follows from function and single stage systems that can take out a lot of, of uh, energy through their atmospheric flight make a ton of sense, right? Why would you do that all? Um, propulsively. So we want to, as a group, as a humanity, be thinking about how the systems we build up at the moon aren't dead ends, aren't a, a one-way trip, if you will, in terms of technology, but that map into what you're going to do at Mars. So the thing on the left is our, our reference concept that we use to drive out decisions and trade studies and so forth uh, internally here at Lockheed. Um, we call that Mars Base Camp. And, and it's sort of funny, a base camp normally is a thing at the bottom of the mountain, and then you climb to the mountain, the top of the mountain. Um, this is sort of backwards in that from orbit, 
um, that's your base camp, and then you you ascend to the summit of the mountain, or in this case, you descend to the surface. And so, what we see is is the need early on for a lot of sortie missions. Um, you don't build your base camp uh, uh, for a long while on the top of Everest. Um, you go there for short experimental activities, and so that colors our view on how we think about exploration, and it very much colors, therefore, how we approach um, from our our architectural approaches, how we approach um, lunar exploration and lunar camps, which again are for us more nomadic um, and able to be um, lightweight and moved, if you will, physically moved, as opposed to um, you know really large systems that are only located at one place, um, at least uh, in the near term. Yeah, and these systems, as they're built up, um, really will start to build on each other. Some of the lander images that you saw for what we were proposing for the moon is really this lander only with a beautiful skin on top of it. And then you can see, obviously, we'll still have the need for rovers, a lot of the other elements that we talked about. Um, so these systems, while packaged differently, often tie, tie from the moon out to Mars. And so as we're planning and looking at moon base camps, you know, how are we going to go ahead and stage and think about the, the Mars base camps um, actually on the surface after we've done this initial stage of sortie missions, you know, figuring out what's the best place to set up a longer term camp. So with that, I'll leave you with what we think is a really cool image of the future with astronauts and robots, you know, exploring Mars for the first time side by side. But again, knowing that everything that we plan to do at the moon is leading to the moment here of being on Mars. Can you go back to slide two and then um, I think we'll open it up to, uh, to questions. Um, the, uh... Slide two is where we had our lenses. I think it was slide two, maybe three. Um, and uh, so I figured we could leave that up. Um, so it's location, you know, where do you want to put this? Um, and, and that is tightly tied to the mission or purpose of the base. But quite honestly, um, the locations themselves will drive what you can do with the locations. And then by definition, those locations also um, have interesting ramifications in terms of your logistics train back to either orbital systems or other surface systems. Um, heck, can you even see the Earth? And, and which, if you can't, because you're on the far side, then by definition, you've got a relationship with um, orbital assets, at least for COP relays. Or COP relays. Um, so with that, we'll, we'll turn it back to our, our hosts um, and see if we have any good hard questions. I, I think you guys just had dinner. So um, you're probably all like tired, um, but hopefully you can muscle up some energy to uh, to ask us some tough questions, ask Danielle some tough questions. Thank you very much, uh, Rob and Daniel. Uh, so we definitely have a lot of questions, but given the time crunch, we try to take as many as possible. Uh, so if um, I may share the screen. So the very first question that we have for you is, which locations do you personally prefer to build a lunar base kit? Can you hear me? I think somehow you're on top. Can you hear us okay now? Yeah, we, uh, I can hear you, yeah. Okay, sounds good, we had a little difficulty. I guess I'll have to sit near Danielle. Oh, are you on? Oh, you're still there, okay. Uh, so we'll use my audio for a little bit. The, um, so my personal favorite is South Pole. Um, there looks to be a lot of water there. Um, I love the idea of um, getting up to the uh, peaks of eternal light and um, starting with solar rays. I'm a big fan of space nuclear, um, it's just, Man, it just runs 24 seven, right? Doesn't, doesn't turn off overnight. But I love the idea of evolving. And so having a, a large solar array system um, at the peaks of eternal light with a, a long power cable running down to, um, to uh, some lean as possible uh, base camp um, at the base, literally at the base of the mountain. Uh, that that would be my, uh, my objectives. That would be if I, if I had uh, enough money, I'd go build that first. 
thank you, uh, Rob. Yeah, we'll let you do the next one. The next one um, we have is um, how are the physiological aspects of long duration lunar missions taken into account in the design of lunar habitats? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, from the very beginning, the psychological and physiological aspects are taken into account. So you start off with how long is your original mission, and then you start to scope how much volume is needed. And then you start to think about additionally, what are the things that I need to consider? Is there going to be a lunar night? How long is that going to be? Um, are my astronauts, do they have a window in their design? Are they gonna be able to see Earth depending on the orientation of how we land? Are they gonna have fresh food? Are they going to be eating fried food? What does their exercise look like? So those are all things that have to be taken into account. And then there's a lot more than that, but again, it's, it's from the very beginning through the end of mission and then some. And now, um, uh, I guess you can say figure chair. Um, the, uh, the, the couple of interesting things, when we look at Orion, which is, um, it's capable of thousand day missions to Orion years, but you, it's really a question of how much else you add on to Orion mission space. Um, but one of the, the biggest, most interesting aspects of the environment the control system for Orion is actually humidity control and the humidity control of during exercise. Um, and so um, oftentimes we don't really think about that. You are pumping a lot of water into the air when the crew exercises. And even if one says gravity, and we don't have a whole lot of experience for long duration days, um, but it sure seems pretty pretty clear that we're going to have to do a fair amount of exercise. And so um, that alone does environmental control life support, um, which in turn quickly gets into this, what are the knees and the curve for reclaiming water, for example. Um, yeah, uh, excuse me, water. sorry. Uh, I'm really sorry to interrupt you. Uh, could you, um, I think there is some problem with your microphone. We can't hear you well. Uh, can oh. you try speaking closer to the microphone again, please? Okay. Um, let's see. Yours was working really well. If you want it. Oh, now it's better. Now it's uh, now it's better. It's, it's yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about that. No, it's all right. Nope. So you can see here. So we'll get a little bit closer and directional to the mic. Are we coming through? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Good. Okay. Yeah. So the uh, bottom line there is the environment control and life support um, is really strongly driven by exercise. And so um, that part of the physiological system and how um, you're gonna maintain that level of muscle mass, um, I think factors just as much into a, a one six gravity system as it does to a, a zero G system. Uh, thank you very much, um, Rob. Uh, moving on to the next question. How do you view the role of the architects to plan the next steps of habitats to maximize human performance? And is there a team already in place? I think I would characterize it as really important in terms of architects to plan because of how expensive space endeavors are, we often benefit from collaborations like you've seen with Orion, with the International Space Station, um, that allows a lot of countries to participate in those endeavors. And so that requires a lot of um, coordination, which is difficult because everybody has a different vision of what they really want and what they want to do. So it, an architect and in that coordination, it's more than just an architect for that specific habitat. It's you know, orchestration um, and agreement on what are the mission objectives and what are we all going to try and attempt to do together, and then to decompose that into an architecture that everybody has a place to play in. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, Rob, would you like to add something to that? Uh, yeah, the only thing I was going to say is um, kudos to uh, you folks for being at the ISU. Mm. Participation in ISU and IAF IAC and the Space Generation and Fusion Forums, um, space symposiums, IEEE conferences. To be honest, that's where the architectural work is taking place. Um, there is no single team out there because there's no single team smart enough to know how to do this on their own. Um, and so your involvement in this, like you, when you asked, is there an architecture team out there? Yeah, it's you guys um, today. And, and as you interact with other, other um, companies, other countries, 
Uh, that is how the architecture is, is really being defined. And it's very messy. It's very, um, what we say, organic in that it grows um, the concepts, but it is the only way to do this in a sustainable way that all of us can contribute. So kudos, kudos for being in this course and working on this particular project. Thank you very much, Rob. Uh, uh, moving on to the next question, given that we can put a base in place, what would be major considerations to keep a lunar base suitable, sustainable or resilient? Yeah, I think the first thing um, for a lunar base to be sustainable is to be able to generate power on its own. So power is one of the number one concerns that Rob and I have talked about and that leads into resilient. Like I said earlier, if you can use a power system strong enough, you can 3D print a landing base and that's gonna keep your landers much closer. And so then your space becomes a little bit more sustainable just because you don't have to traverse as far. So power is one. Secondly, closed loop life support systems. So you're not dumping consumables that could be used. So again, that gets you to that kind of closed loop system where you're not having to bring up as many consumables that, you know, again, single use items, if you think about that. And then resilient to so make use of all the infrastructure for common data to be able to have multiple paths for these items that you really depend on. Um, so again, multiple power paths, multiple paths for um, communications to earth um, and to the other elements in place. Did you have anything to add in terms of? Okay, so I think moving on to the next question uh, we have is, have your designs already reached a level where innovation seems not to offer much advancements? In other words, have you already integrated all possible designs or is there still much to do? Yeah, anybody that thinks they have um, gotten to the point where it's all locked in um, is about to to go down in flames. <laughs> um, the, uh, the truth is um, there is so much of this. There's, there's an interesting um, book written by, uh, I think uh, MIT actually, and uh, I can't remember the name of it, but anyway, it talks about uh, the dominant design. And when you get to a point where most designs for a particular um, problem, most solutions look alike, then you've converged. And at that point, um, any, changes any new uh, opportunities to, to accomplish that same thing um, really become disruptors. We haven't reached the dominant design yet. Um, when you look at, gosh, um, the, just talk about surface access to the moon. Um, Dynetics was kind of a one and a half stage system. Uh, SpaceX was clearly a one stage system and the Blue Origin Lockheed Martin Northrop Draper team uh, was a three stage system. Um, we're all gonna use refuelers to make it sustainable. So refueling is sort of um, converged. We weren't, gonna, we weren't gonna create fuel out of the quantum foam or something like that, right? So parts of it had really converged, but how you go about solving the problems, totally up in the air. Um, and that is true as well. Are you gonna live in the tubes or live on the surface or live on the surface underneath regolith? Are you 3D printing um, your, uh, your stuff or bringing it all from home and what's the order in which you do that. All of that innovation is completely wide open. And, and I think, heck, we haven't even agreed on what the voltage level is going to be yet. Thank you, Rob. Uh, Daniel, would you like to add something? No, I think Rob nailed it. Okay, moving on to our next question. Will we need some kind of gigantic super magnet structure to establish a stronger magnetic field on Mars to maintain a habitable atmosphere? That is a great question. So um, this gets into, you know, broadly speaking, terraforming versus um, bring your own system. Uh, I think probably, and it's probably failure of imagination, but I've been focused on um, bring our own habitation with us for a while, a long while. So whether they're large domes or whether they're um, uh, in habitable volumes with mobility and so forth, uh, just, this is kind of Rob's opinion as opposed to Lockheed Martin position, um, but we've got a lot to learn about Mars before we change its atmosphere. Um, whether or not there's life, um, whether there's signs of life, the last thing we'd want to do is accidentally 
um, pollute that, if you will, uh, and, and not be able to definitively know whether we're alone in the cosmos um, in terms of planetary life here on Earth. So um, in order to maintain an atmosphere, you do need a magnetic field. That's one of the causes of why Mars is a pretty desolate place today is it lost the magnetic field and then the atmosphere had been stripped off molecule by molecule as time has gone on. Um, but I think uh, we, the objective at the moment is um, provide those habitable volumes for ourselves um, and, uh, and kick the... Uh, Kick the terraforming question down a couple of generations. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rob. And before we close the session, I think we can take one more question. So I would like to go with this one. Um, so could you suggest <laughs> in a timeline in years where we are going to land on the moon or Mars and set up permanent colonies there according to you, not the government? A loaded question. That's a loaded question. I, we'll give uh, each of us the answer. I'm sure they'll be slightly different. I think in terms of permanent colonies, I think the moon will be in 2030s. And I think Mars will be in 2040s or 2050s for permanent structures, not the first sortie missions. Uh, for me, a long time. So um, uh, for me, when I become a zillionaire, a trillionaire, um, we could be to Mars orbit safely uh, in about a decade. Um, so if we combine the, the will and the skill, to be honest, of everybody and ensured that we weren't um, duplicating efforts and that we were um, ensuring stuff is feed forward, um, I'm confident we could do that. The technologies exist today for Mars. Um, there's no, you know, we don't need antimatter and anti-gravity and things like that. Um, it's just mechanical engineering, to be honest. Um, so I would say uh, Mars orbit, by, um, certainly by 2033, which is a nice sweet spot for radiation and, um, and the delta V required. Um, from a lunar perspective, um, landing 2024, um, first, uh, so those are the early sortie missions and um, 2026, early mobility and, um, and systems that could support us up to uh, uh, a month at a time. So I would say... Um, 26 for sortie missions on the surface for a month at a time, uh, 28 for a semi-permanent capability on the moon, uh, 31 for uh, orbit around Mars and first Mars landing in 33 and then uh, permanent self-sufficient, I'll go 35. Thank you very much, uh, Rob and Daniel. Uh, I think we can take one last question before we wind up the session. So just one last to go with, how does the Skunk Words idea run through the cooperation identity and culture of your organization and what does it enable and allow that makes a difference? You know, the, um, uh, we, I, we actually have some, uh, I can't show them because I'll get sued like three ways from Sunday, but we have the Skunk wearing um, the Marvin the Martian helmet um, which uh, neither aerospace, uh, uh, our Skunk Works guys haven't seen that, and, um, and certainly Warner Brothers or whoever owns Marvin the Martian. Um, but that is exactly how we're approaching um, Cislunar. I think, you know, we talk about commercial space, and sometimes people forget Lockheed is a commercially traded company. Um, yeah, we have to, um, to make a buck, and we've got our, our shareholders to worry about, uh, but we're as commercial as anybody. The way that this is is shaping out is um, you got to invest and you have to have the best solution um, by the time someone needs it. And so the days of, of um, just waiting for RFPs, requests for proposals to come out, um, or waiting for um, a little bit too much lead from the government, those days are over. And so now uh, it, it's whoever's got the best idea that can do it incrementally and do it quickly. And that's what Skunk Works is all about. And so we talk about going skunk a lot around here. Um, and that's just referring to the concept of, um, you know, this is different from how we do a lot of our work for, uh, for the government. Um, this is fast, um, fail fast, don't fail if you can avoid it. But if you're gonna fail, fail early um, and get that incremental capabilities up and running. Um, so it's, uh, it's what we think about to be honest every day. Daniel, would you like to add some final words? 
Yeah, I think uh, what Rob said is absolutely true. And we actually try and encompass the mentality of, you know, what Rob said with fail fast um, in a lot of the stuff that we do in advanced programs where Rob and I work. So I think that part is pretty exciting in terms of how we take that mentality and bring it forward into these future missions. So thank you very much, Rob and Daniel. That was a wonderful session. And to all the participants for submitting your incredible questions. So that brings us to the end of our session today. And once again, a big thank you to Lockheed Martin and thank Rob you. and Daniel for taking out your time and passing it over to Strasbourg. Thank you very much. Okay. Absolutely. Got one more comment here. Yeah. Yes, sir. Sorry, let me just go into the camera view, otherwise I feel a little weird. Okay. Yes, hi. Um, so, well, thank you very much for your presentation. And I really like your answers on your, um, your own kind of like timeline on how the, when we can arrive moon and Mars. Um, if you ever need some lunar based or Martian based architects or designers or lawyers and stuff, you have about 20 people waiting here for, for hire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, well, um, it, it's great that you uh, touched, uh, talked a lot on uh, selection uh, of uh, locations of lunar bases. Because earlier today, I just gave them a talk as well. And uh, they have some, uh, uh, they have a lot of more knowledge now to, to get started on this project. And uh, yeah, we're really excited to dig in. And we're going to hear some more presentations for the rest of the month um, from different uh, uh, fields, uh, experts from different, different fields. So um, yeah, I think we're, we're ready to build our lunar base. And uh, yeah. uh, we're of course going to hand you some uh, spectacular results and you're welcome to of course dial in for the final uh, presentation if time, uh, time zone allows. But yeah, well, thank Thanks. you. So, and, uh, and of course, thank you for sponsoring us and uh, we really appreciate this opportunity. Yeah. Our, our pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, have a great day. Are we good? So, Rabba? Okay. Is our live stream stop? Hey, all. Stream has been stopped.